Good morning. It's Thursday, July 9th. I'm glad that you're with me. We're studying the book of Jude together, and I want to apologize for yesterday. I did misspeak. We still have a little bit to wrap up on the neg the characteristics of these really awful teachers in the life of the church. We are making a transition today, though. So let's look at uh, Jude and verse 17. But dear friends... Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Now, I want you to um, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 20. In the book of Acts chapter 20. And uh, we find some words from the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20. Paul had been visiting the leaders in the church of Ephesus, and he knows this is the last time he's going to see them. And so he says in chapter 20, Acts 20, verse 25 and following, he says, Now I know that none of you among whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom of God will I ever see again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of all men, Verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I, that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. So therefore, when you come to Jude, let's go back to Jude now. When we're in Jude and Jude is writing, remember what the apostle said, that ought to trigger within us that we ought not be surprised. Think about this, friends. It's okay to be disappointed. You should be disappointed. But you should not be surprised when one of these leaders turns out to be bad and rotten within the life of the church. It's regrettable. It's horrible. I always dread it when something like this happens. It's very painful to deal with. But you shouldn't be surprised because it is a part of the fallen nature that even infects us within the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. So, verse uh, uh, 18, they told you that in the last days there will be scoffers. Now, that's an echo of what we saw uh, a previous week, a couple, a couple of days ago in verse 10, where Jude writes that these men speak abusively about what they do not understand. These people are scoffers. Um, their, their language and their edification does not build up the body of Christ. In fact, he goes on in verse 19 to amplify that. These are men who divide you. Now, friends, the call of God upon our lives in the kingdom of God, in, in the body of Christ, is that we would experience unity. But that unity is based on the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's founded on him. So therefore, if someone is not in Christ and doesn't really care about following Christ, then there's not going to be true unity. Likewise, unity is also based, genuine unity is based on truth. And so if there's falsehood and error, and I'm not talking about mere difference of opinion, I'm talking about genuine falsehood and error. When that's happening, when heresy and false teaching is being propagated, it, it's not possible to have true, genuine unity. So if you've got these false teachers teaching horrible things, living a horrible lifestyle, they're not gonna, you're not going to be able to experience unity with them, not only that, but also their very nature, part of their fallen nature, is to divide people. That's what Paul said. People will, and they will draw people after themselves. They care more about people being on their side than they do truth and following Christ and uplifting the body of Christ. And then, in the New International Version, we have the following in verse 19. 
these people who follow mere natural instincts. Now, in the old King James Version that I, that I grew up with when I first became a Christian, it uses the word sensual. They are sensual. And that's probably not the best translation for our modern day and age. It probably was a great word that meant what it should mean in the 1600s when the King James was written. Today, that word sensual to us primarily, almost exclusively, not totally, but almost exclusively has things to do with sexuality. And that's not what this means. There are other words in the Bible and Greek words that mean that. In this case, it means fleshly. It has it has to do with our physical bodies. In fact, this is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's talking about our resurrected bodies, how Jesus got a resurrected body, and we will too one day. And Paul compares fleshly bodies, natural bodies, and resurrected bodies, saying that they're not the same thing. And that's a great truth. I love that, because when the resurrection happens, I don't want this old body back. I want a new body. And the promise of God is I'm going to get a new body. Resurrected bodies are not resuscitated old bodies. Well, the old bodies, that's the word that Paul uses. It's it is, it's a fleshly body. In fact, it's an interesting word. It's a, it's the adjective form of the noun soul. So literally, it's soulish bodies. It's it's the body that houses our soul. And this is contrasted with in 1 Corinthians 15, with spiritual bodies. So consequently, Jude is saying that these bad leaders are base, they're, they're worldly, they're fleshly, they are unspiritual. They obviously don't have the mind of Christ in them. And finally, we get to the last characteristic of these people. And that is they do not have the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, that is big, and that's something that requires a little bit of uh, explanation and a little bit of uh, exploration. These people don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, that also means something else. It's sort of like a domino effect. If this is true, then the next thing is true. It's a domino effect. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to turn to two passages. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says in verse 6, Galatians 4, 6, he's talking about salvation and the nature of salvation in Christ Jesus. He says, and, and the word son here is equated with what it means to be a Christian, to be saved. He says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So Paul is making it clear here that if you know Christ, if you're part of the family of God, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And then we go uh, just a couple more pages to Ephesians chapter 1. I mean, we could look at several verses. I'm just going to pick out two. In Ephesians chapter 1, look with me at verse 13. Paul writes these words. And you also were included in Christ another phrase for salvation. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were marked in Christ with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our, our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Paul makes it clear in both of these passages, here in Ephesians chapter 1, when you got saved, a lot of things happened to you. Your sins were forgiven. Uh, your citizenship was transferred to heaven. That's a great Bible study, by the way. What happened to you the moment you got saved? Wow. I made a list one time, and it's a long list. It's a long list. Well, here's one of them right here. When you got saved... God's, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living and present in your life. Now, this is important because when I was a young Christian, 
Um, I was taught something. Maybe some of you have heard this. I don't know. I, I was taught a long time ago when I first became a Christian and began growing in the Lord. I was tried to understand the nature of salvation and the Holy Spirit and all this. And somebody told me this. Time. They said, when you get saved, you get Jesus. And then in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you get the Holy Spirit. And I believed that for a while. But then as I was studying the scripture, like two verses that we saw today, this e today, that's when I realized, wait a second, that's not true. The baptism of the Holy Spirit must mean something else, a deeper filling, a deeper surrender. But it doesn't mean you get the Holy Spirit. I didn't have him before, and now I have him. That's not what it means. That was true the first time it happened in the book of Acts, but that's the first time when the church was born. But in your experience and mine, that is not a true statement. Paul is writing after Pentecost, and he makes it clear that if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Now go back to Jude. Process the dominoes. So if these people, if these people don't have the Holy Spirit, they do not have the Holy Spirit, then that must mean they're not saved. They're not even Christians. They're not born again. Now, what is so astonishing about this, friends? I mean, what, what's so remarkable and amazing about this is, remember who we're talking about. These are leaders in the church. These are teachers. These are prominent people within the life of the church. And they're not even saved, which means they're not a part of the true church. Remember, there's there's two kinds of churches. There's the visible church. That's the one you can get in your car, drive to, or walk to, and walk in a building, and there's a bunch of people. You see the people. That's the church. It's On one hand, it's a building. On another hand, it's a group of people gathered together in the name of Christ. That is an, an expression. We call that the visible church. But friends, that is not the ultimate real church. And the reason for that is Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a net. The net catches all kinds of fish. It catches bad fish and good fish. And at the end of time, the nets will be pulled up and the fish will be separated. And so churches, all churches, have lost people in them. By the way, that's a good thing. If, you're, if you attend a different church... I hope, for heaven's sakes, I hope you got lost people in your church. If you don't, what are you doing wrong? You show me a church that has every last possible person in it that knows and loves Jesus, and I'll show you a church that's not doing evangelism. The church ought to be an incubator of faith. It ought to be a place where lost people come, they start to hear the gospel, they get involved in classes, they attend worship, they hear preaching, and their mind is open, the Spirit of God gets inside their spirits and touches them, they feel convicted, and sooner or later the moment comes and they surrender to Christ. That's what happened to me. I got saved because of the ministry of people planting the word of God in my life. That's the way it ought to be. Every church ought to have lost people in it. And so, and so the key here is that even though lost people can be present in the church, they're not part of the true church, the invisible church, which only includes people who are born again, who are truly part of the body of Christ. And how can you tell who's in and who's not? Well, you can inspect the fruit of their lives. I mean, that's part of what Jesus said. That's what Paul said. That's what Jude said. But ultimately, you and I ultimately can't really know. That's between each person and God. It's not, it's not ultimately my call to know absolutely. I can have an opinion, but ultimately, uh, it's like a preacher told me one time. He said, you know, Ronnie... He said, when we die and we get to heaven, there are going to be people there that you're going to look at them and think, how in the world did they get in? I'm shocked. And hopefully they won't say that about you. But that's going to happen. There are going to be people who make it that we're going to be surprised. And based on what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 
there's also going to be people you look around and you can't find them. And you thought, well, I thought for sure they're going to make it. But Jesus said, um, even those who, who claim Lord, Lord, you know, calling on the name of Jesus, say, Lord, Lord, depart from me for I never knew you, Jesus said. So ultimately, God knows who the true church is. It's not my business to do that. My, my job is to try to be faithful to Christ, help other people be faithful to Christ, and if someone doesn't know the Lord, help them come to know the Lord. My whole point in all this is it should not be astonishing to you that these people happen, uh, grow up and become leaders in the church. We ought to not want that to happen. But these people are not saved, and they need the Lord. And the chaos that they, we, while we can't be sure ultimately only God can, the evidence, the evidence abounds that these people know the Lord. And so we ought to pray for them. We ought to stand up for the word of God, and we ought to, in love, speak the truth. I'm not calling on people to have a war. That isn't, that's not what we're called to do. But we are called to stand for the truth and be faithful to the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to pause here today. Tomorrow, Friday, we're going to finish the book of Jude, for real. Um, and there's some powerful words here, friends. God has a powerful word. So the book ends. I'm just going to let leave this with you to ponder. Given the fact that these bad leaders are in the church, what now? What now for you? Jude talks about that, and that's where we're going to conclude tomorrow. Let's pray together. Father, Father, I pray that your word would penetrate each and every heart. I pray that it would penetrate mine, that you would speak to me, that you would convict me, that you would open my eyes to things that I haven't seen before. Lord, that you would give us a loving spirit, that within the church, you would help us continually be on the lookout to love on and welcome those who are struggling in their faith, they're wanting to know more, and in the doors of our physical churches, they find welcome, loving arms, a group of people who, who deeply want them to be known relationally and also to know Jesus, to hear the truth. Give us a heart for the lost, Lord. And Lord, help us to learn to speak the truth in love, to declare your word with firmness and clarity, without being embarrassed, but to speak the truth because truth sets people free. And when error and falsehood propagates, it leads to confusion, it leads to division, it leads to worldliness and ungodliness, and it leads people ultimately away from you. So help us to be faithful and help us to hold on to the ideas that it really matters what we believe. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. Have a good day in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if it's not in him, then it will ultimately be an empty day. This is first light.